Necromancy is the brand new fourth combat style ever introduced to Runescape. Not only is it very fun to use, but it is insanely powerful. But just how powerful is that? To answer that question, I spent weeks testing out Necromancy at every single boss in the game. So now seems like the perfect opportunity to make a tier list. Without further ado, we have a ton of bosses to cover. Welcome to the complete edition of Testing Out Necromancy. Starting things off, let's go to everyone's least favorite ice boss, the Archglacer. At the Archglacer, I found Necromancy to perform ridiculously well for a couple of reasons. The first thing that's really important is that at the Archglacer, you get the same five mechanics repeated over and over again. And one of the issues with the other combat styles is you'll use an ultimate ability and then the boss will use a special attack that will prevent you from being able to deal damage. This is one of the things that most players really don't like about the Archglacer. It's very unsatisfying to pop an ultimate and then end up losing it because the boss decided to do a special attack when the order is random. But with Necromancy, it's pretty much a non-issue because the way it fundamentally works is you can build up your sacks and save them and spend them whenever you would like. They don't really expire like the damage window on another combat style. So whenever there's a good dealing damage window, you can deal a ton of damage. You can save up your stacks until the next time that it'll be good to use them. In addition to this, the darkness incantation is awesome, especially at the higher end rages where the boss starts to deal a lot of damage. And if you never want to have to worry about the minions ever again, it's as easy as using the threads of fate incantation and then using volley of souls, soul sap, and then volley of souls again. Any kill you do above 2,500% in rage, the minion HP begins to scale, and they get up to above 100,000 life points. And even then, with that many life points, you can still one-shot that entire group with the exact same operation. Not only is it foolproof, but look at those hit splats. The first kill that we just watched was me breaking, at the time of recording, the 500% in rage world record at the Archglacer. But what about 1,000% in rage? Is it still going to perform well there? And I broke the world record again. But we have to be thorough here, and there are more enrages than just 500% and 1000%. What if we took the enrage a little bit higher? Now, I'm a very busy person, and it would be insane for me to spend 20 hours on one singular boss. That would just... Okay, so I spent 20 straight hours pushing Archglacer, and I can with 100% accuracy and certainty guarantee that Necromancy is insane here. I managed to do 82 kills in a row before I died a single time, and every single one of these kills was the highest enrage I'd ever done. That's a total streak of about a thousand enrage without a single death. I've done thousands of kills with this boss, and no prior experience has been anything like this. This is the perfect boss to showcase and use Necromancy. Every single advantage that Necromancy has over the conventional three combat styles absolutely shines at this boss and I could not recommend it enough. And you already know I went and sent 4,000%. I now have the Golden Iceborne title, and that is very much in thanks to Necromancy. Unfortunately, at the Court Beast, you need to use a spear to deal full damage, so you'd expect Necromancy probably won't perform that well, because... Huh? So it turns out with Necromancy, you only deal half damage at the Court Beast, but unfortunately for the Court Beast, half damage is still a hell of a lot more damage than you would do using melee with a spear. If you're planning on AFKing Corp, I would still strongly recommend melee, but if you're planning on actively taking out the Court Beast to maximize your kills per hour, Necromancy absolutely slaps, in a way that it probably shouldn't. It feels actually very weird that it slaps like this, but hey, I didn't make the combat style, and it is extremely good at the Court Beast. Next up, we're going to the Calphite King, and to the surprise of not very many people, Calphite King is one of my most hated bosses in RuneScape. And even though you can solo the boss effectively and block the green attack, it's just an annoying boss fight in general. You have some weird interactions with affinities and hit chances and it digging over and over and over again. And in addition to that, if you mistime the green attack, well, guess what? You've got to teleport out and try again from the beginning. With Necromancy, you can go in, preset up your conjures, and do so much damage to the boss that you can pretty much skip well, the entire boss. The difference between this and a different combat style and a very good rotation is pretty simple. With Necromancy, it doesn't matter which form Calphite King spawns in. Whether it's ranged, melee, or magic, you can have a very similar situation. That is a 24 second Calphite King kill, and I was able to have a similar experience across all three spawns. And because of that, Calphite King decidedly goes in an S, because I have absolutely no interest in doing the Calphite King with any other combat style, but not only did I find success going in with Necromancy, crazily enough, I actually had fun. Just look out for those green shields, because Necromancy does a lot of damage, and a lot of damage on a heal healing mechanic means a lot of healing. Next up on the chopping block, we're going to be heading to Zuck. We're going to start things out with hard mode and then get into normal mode later. 
But Hardwell Duck, Necromancy in general performs extremely well, and I would say it is better than a setup with magic where you're using Crypt Bloom and Animate Dead, or even any combination of Crypt Bloom, Obsidian Armor, and Animate Dead. Overall, the combination of damage reduction from the Darkness Incantation, as well as the damage output and area of effect tools that you get with Necromancy, allows for an extremely fun, extremely smooth set of waves. If you have Threads of Fate available, you can use Threads of Fate to do an absolute ton of damage. If it's on cooldown, well, you probably have Death Skulls, and Death Skulls will just bounce around pretty much one-shotting an entire wave. And if you somehow got both Threads of Fate and Death Skulls on cooldown, you also have Soul Scythe, which does an absolute ton of damage as well and has a short cooldown, so it's pretty spammable. When you're looking at the DPS checks, they go extremely smoothly because you can pre-set up all of your stacks and then unleash them. On Haraken, I found I had a very easy one cycle, and not that that's incredibly difficult to do with the other combat styles, but I found it to be very consistent and very relaxed. And getting that death mark off at the end is extremely satisfying. Just when you're worried that the boss might head back under and make you wait another minute, you get the death mark proc and it's over. For the actual Zuck part of the fight itself, I didn't really have any complaints. The six tile attack range I thought could be a bit of a problem for pizza time, but it wasn't an issue at all, so long as you're willing to have both keybinds for surge as well as dive for accuracy. And you'll see here in this clip, I was able to cruise to a very relaxed, very easy two cycle in hard mode, which is consistent with what I'd be able to do with magic. What wasn't consistent with magic was the overall kill time, as my previous personal record was 18 minutes and 30 seconds, and we are on a significantly better pace than that. And that magic time was something that I worked fairly hard at for the better part of an afternoon. But now, there's one negative that we do have to talk about. This is going to be fixed at some point, but there's currently a bug with Deathmark, where sometimes on the conduit, it will go off multiple times instead of just once. And although this is very nice for a speed kill, it can catch you off guard, because without warning, you can prepare for one singular bomb, and you can get slapped in the face with two. If you're going for your first ever Zuck Cape, or you're wearing the power gear which Deathmarks automatically, that can end up putting you in a very bad spot. But outside of that one negative, Necromancy has all the tools for an absolutely fantastic hard mode Zuck run, and it would be my strong recommendation, whether you're planning on doing a ton of Zuck runs and you're experienced, or you're going for your very first one. I also got my Zuck title during testing, and that's just icing on the cake. Heading into normal mode, I learned something new, which is that if you get the boss phase to 100,000 life points before pizza time, it automatically phases into pizza time so that you're stuck getting one no matter how fast you go. I thought I was just gonna skip the whole thing and manage to just wipe the entire boss, but apparently that is not the case. So you'll see here, I got it to the 100,000 HP phase point with ease. And then after that, I was surprised to find that I still had to deal with the pizza phase. Clearing the entirety of normal mode Zuck in under 12 minutes is extremely cool. And both normal mode and hard mode Zuck belong decidedly in the S tier with Necromancy. Next up on the chopping block, we've got Rise of the Six. Now, Rise of the Six is a 0.6 second boss fight in teams of four and two, and that's not even a necromancy thing. It was doable with ranged and also with melee as well on certain rotations. And because of that, I didn't really wanna focus on doing Rise of the Six in groups of two, three, or four. Regardless of the setup you wanna bring, your kill time is gonna be extremely quick and you don't have a whole lot to worry about. But solo is a little bit different because in a solo Rise of the Six kill, you have to wait until the brothers all cross onto the same side. And in order to do that, you can't kill any of the brothers on your side yet. You have to wait about 25 seconds and then after the elapsed period of time has passed, all of the brothers will cross over and then at that point, you need to do as much area of effect damage as humanly possible. And as you could probably imagine, Necromancy leans extremely well into this because you can spend that first 25 seconds of the fight just building up your stacks on the existing brothers without killing any of them. And then as soon as everybody crosses over, you can absolutely unleash with a Threads of Fate combination, your Death Guard special attack, and Volley of Souls. And in doing that, you will have the easiest Rise of the Six solo of your life. Look, I've done a ton of Rise of the Six solos. Rise of the Six was even the first episode of my solo-only Iron Man series from a couple years back. And I've gotta say, compared to that, this was a whole different experience. It was cohesive, it was fun, and for that reason, it's going right in the S tier. Raksha is one of the most popular bosses in RuneScape. I think it's the perfect length of time to have some fun, engaging, interesting mechanics, but there is one annoying aspect to the Raksha fight. And in my experience, that's clearing the pools. It's a little bit of switchscape because most people will end up having to bring a two-handed weapon and then laceration boots, and then you've got to do a switch, clear the pools at the right timing, and if you don't do that, you end up having a really bad experience. And I am here to let you know that clearing the pools with laceration boots is no longer a thing that you will ever have to concern yourself with ever again. And there are two ways of getting around it. The first is what you're currently watching, which is a number of kills back to back to back to back to back, 
where I quite simply just skipped the pools by spending all of my stacks and instantly phasing the boss before he had a chance to do anything with them. This is something that is possible to do with magic, melee, and ranged, but it is significantly more technical and more difficult to do. And with Necromancy, I found it to be 95% consistent. Almost every single time I went for a pool skip, I was able to get it, no problem at all. But let's say you're not the most experienced with your damage output, and you don't really want to mess around with trying a pool skip where if you mess it up, you end up taking a ton of extra damage, and it kind of scuffs up the rest of the kill. Well, have I got some good news for you. Because not only does Necromancy offer a ton of damage for pool skips, but it also offers a ton of area effect abilities that you can use to very simply and effectively clear the pools yourself. I experimented with a number of ways to do this, and I didn't find any method that I preferred over any other one. The easiest ability you can use to clear the pools is Bloat, because so long as all of the pools on the floor are connected to each other, using Bloat will guarantee that they all die. For the pools that aren't completely connected, you have some other good options as well. The first option is to use the Threads of Fate incantation, and then you could use Soul Sap, Volley of Souls, and then Soul Sap again, and that will immediately clear three sets of pools. Alternatively to that, you could also go and use Soul Scythe, and that will get the job done extremely well to you. I was able to consistently skip the pools and consistently kill Raksha in right around two minutes, which is pretty good and consistent with a high level of proficiency in the other combat styles. And the only reason it's going in A tier instead of S tier is because the conjurers get stuck on the last phase all the time. There might be a patch coming to this in the future, but as it currently stands, they are not the smartest. And if your skeleton gets stuck on the last phase, you're going to be missing out on an absolute ton of damage, and you'll actually have to re-conjure him, which can be pretty annoying. Next up, we are heading in to Elite Dungeon 1. And you know how Elite Dungeon 1 has a ton of mobs that are extremely annoying to deal with? They will stun you, they'll deal a ton of damage, they can really end up ruffling your feathers and ruining your general dungeon experience. Well with Necromancy, fear the minions no more. Whether it's a Threads of Fate and Volley of Souls combo, Soul Scythe, or even a Death Skulls, when used correctly, the minions will die before they have a chance to spec you at all. When it comes to the Sanctum Guardian, this is a boss fight that you can more or less wipe with a good ultimate ability rotation with any of the four combat styles. But with Necromancy, I was able to get myself a personal record in not very many attempts, and overall I thought it performed so Solidly. At Masuda, the story was more of the same. I was able to get it to the water phase within less than one singular ultimate ability, and then it's time to spend more time than we spent actually fighting the boss, running around the room, and attacking waters. One thing I will mention here is that because Necromancy only has a six tile attack range, you do end up having to get a little bit closer to the waters than you otherwise would just to be able to reach them, but considering you only get the damage reduction buff from killing each water, if you're in melee distance, I'm not going to dock it at all for this. And just like that, that is a 2 minute and 18 second personal record at Masuda, which is pretty cool. And then we get to Seryu. There are a number of different ways to take on Seryu, but if you're doing super, super end game Seryu solos, ideally you try to get a one cycle. And the general strategy is as follows. You try to nuke the first two crystals entirely before the wave of healers. Because the healers can't bring back a crystal from the dead, you just wait until they all dissipate and then you have a short window of time to nuke the third and final crystal, completing your successful one cycle. But with Necromancy, although it might not seem like I'm doing a whole lot of anything as I redo all of my conjures, well, you're gonna find that I was able to do something absolutely insane, which is a one cycle at Seryu on top of the crystal before the first set of healers. This is absolutely ridiculous, and as someone who does a lot of Seryu and really enjoys the boss fight, this is completely bonkers, and this is not something that I thought would ever be possible to complete. Not only is that a personal record, but that is a faster and more effective skip than what I was able to get while hybriding with magic and melee at once. There's only one thing that I'm going to dock Necromancy for, and it was the overall clunkiness of getting onto Seryu's back. Upon doing so, the majority of my conjurers wouldn't follow me up there, and because of that, I had to dismiss them after the first crystal and then take the time to re-conjure all of them. This didn't end up costing me in kill time, but it was pretty annoying to have to pause my rotation in the middle of what should be a pretty hard DPS check and just sit there and redo my conjures for about 10 seconds. And because of that, I'm going to put Seryu in the A tier, and I would absolutely go back with Necromancy, but it wasn't so good that that's the only combat style I would ever bring there. That being said, if Mod Ryan isn't playing around and actually makes a Conjure Undead Army button that will allow you to summon all of your conjures in one single global cooldown, well that could sway me to bump it up to an S. Heading into ED2, I'm going to say a lot of similar things to the first Elite Dungeon, such as the area of effect on Necromancy is absolutely second to none, and it absolutely outmatches the other combat styles by a long shot. The amount of tools you get in your toolbox makes clearing the dungeon extremely fun, satisfying, and most importantly, fast. When we're looking at Astalarn, something that's fun to note is that if you're using the Split Soul Incantation, you can actually deal damage to the boss through the hit caps. So even though the boss's HP is supposed to pause until you've done the Neuron Star and all the rest, you can actually go past it, and that allowed me to get myself a personal record at the boss. 
The ability to hold five souls at once was extremely nice for clearing the Celestial Dragons and blocking their heal, because normally you'd need to make sure you were managing your cooldowns correctly, and instead with Necromancy, so long as I had some souls floating above my character's head, I knew that whenever I needed a stun, all I'd have to do is hit Soul Strike. You're gonna notice at this point of the video that there's a current trend here, which is the boss fights that have a kill time of around a minute to two minutes get absolutely nuked with necromancy. I think it's a product of being the perfect length of time to go in with all of your conjurers pre-summoned and then having the opportunity to do a full living death rotation without really any downtime. And because of that, at Veracleth, once again, we got another absolutely ridiculous personal record. But what about the Blackstone Dragon? This is another boss fight that you can do sort of the normal way where you progress through the boss fight, you clear the four hands, you kill the boss, and then you wait for 45 seconds throughout the lore phase. But if you want to be a little more advanced, you can do something called a flight skip or a lore skip. And in order to do this, there are a couple steps. The first step is to try to get a pre-phase. So this means instead of phasing at 520,000 life points where it normally would spawn the black hands, try to get a little bit of extra damage done. And then at that point, once you've cleared the hands, you want to do as much damage as you possibly can to the boss to clear it entirely. And if you can clear it while he's spinning the very first time, you won't get a flight phase at all. This is something that I've personally done with both magic and ranged, and it worked similarly to the other styles with necromancy. I'm not gonna lie and say it was significantly better than doing it with the other styles, but the one big difference is that on those styles, I was on a Slayer task using the Slayer Helm damage boost. And of course for necromancy, there is no Slayer Helm attachment, so there is no benefit in having a Slayer task. And despite being off task, we were still able to get one of these done, albeit after several tries. Overall for Elite Dungeon 2, I'm gonna put necromancy in the S tier. I got a personal record at all three bosses, and I also had the cleanest, easiest, most most enjoyable mob clears of my entire life. So for me, if I were going to go back to Elite Dungeon the second, it would be with Necromancy. I hope you brought your underwater gear for this one because we are heading to the third Elite Dungeon. As you've already covered Elite Dungeons 1 and 2, I'm just going to brush over this and say that the mob clears were extremely effective in all of the ways that you'd expect at this point. But now let's talk about the boss fights. I still don't completely understand what happened here because I decided to be conservative here and I didn't even bother doing a living death rotation. I quite simply spent all of my stacks and then I looked up at the Crassian Leviathan's life points and they were just about completely expired. And I still have absolutely no idea how I was able to output this amount of damage without even using an ultimate ability. So that's a pretty sweet deal. Although decidedly slower than my 12 second Terracut solo with magic, that took 20 hours, and this took exactly 1 minute and 15 seconds, no more, no less. There wasn't anything special or noteworthy about this Terracut kill, but the damage output was very good and consistent. And I really liked the decision-making aspect of figuring out how much damage I needed to do to the phase of the boss, and determining what my best course of action would be with regard to my stacks. Do I want to spend all my souls, or would it be better to save them for a later point when I have more damage to deal? And in approaching it that way, I found the gameplay loop to be pretty fun. It was enjoyable to figure out how to best approach the boss fight, and it was very consistent as well. An Ambassador Skip is one of the more difficult speed kills that I have ever done. It took me a number of hours to be able to do with magic, it involved a ton of switches and a Give ton of weapon stalling, but I wanted to see if it would be easier to do with Necromancy. In order to skip the spinners at Ambassador, you have to phase the boss immediately from 650,000 life points to 550,000. If you can do this between the Ambassador's attacks, you can completely skip the spinner phase, which is both extremely cool and a massive time save. And after several hours of attempts, I was able to get myself a beautiful solo spinner skip with Necromancy, where the vast majority of my damage came from using Volley of Souls with the Split Soul Incantation. Since posting a video of me doing this, it has been beaten, but at the time of recording, this was the world record fastest Ambassador solo ever. And for that reason, as well as the aforementioned ones, 83 is going to be deposited straight in the S tier of the most lopsided tier list in history. One of the most popular bosses in the entire game is Vindicta, and I thought I would take my time here to actually give you guys a super thorough, comprehensive review of how Necromancy performs there, because I know a lot of people- Oh, it died. Not to get all introspective on you guys, but on release, all of these God Wars Dungeon 2 bosses were extremely unique and different. They had very different fights, you had to deal with the mechanics in different ways, and now they are pretty much all exactly the same. You show up, you hit the strong abilities more than the weak abilities, and a couple seconds later, the boss will have died. Necromancy performs very well here, but so do all the other styles, because believe it or not, we've had a little bit of power creep in the last seven years. Of the four God Resentation 2 bosses, the Twin Furies are the only one that is actually worth properly highlighting with Necromancy. Not only are there two of them, but there's also a weird bug where there are no hit caps at the Twin Furies. So because of that, if you want to hit a 70k, you can just go and hit a 70k. So what I did here is I walked into the boss fight with all of my stacks, and then immediately as they spawned, it was as simple as using Threads of Fate, Volley of Souls, and my Death Guard special, and just like that, you've got yourself a beautiful 5 second Twin Furies kill. 
You might be expecting me to go to Hellware next, but I want you to know that Hellware is not real and can't hurt you. Next up, let's check out Raziel. Raziel is a weird boss to put on a tier list and categorize how effective necromancy is at it, considering you cannot use any of the other combat styles. He's completely and utterly immune to all damage forms that aren't necromancy, which thematically makes a lot of sense, but for the sake of ranking it and comparing it to the other combat styles, well, it puts me in a bit of a tough spot. All I'm gonna say is I had a lot of fun at this boss fight with necromancy, and especially once you've got the tier 95 gear, you will have an easy time absolutely melting him, as long as you're following a rotation that makes a certain amount of sense, and you're using the reflectability on the last phase. I also think it's a little bit weird that the darkness incantation does not work at Raziel because he can't splash. I think from a thematic standpoint, it's sort of strange that you would learn the darkness incantation sort of through the narrative storyline of necromancy and then you wouldn't actually have a chance to use it at the boss that's designed to test your necromantic abilities. But, but alas, it's not the end of the world. What is the end of the world though is the amount of runes you may have wasted if you've been doing Raziel with Greater Bone Shield. Because for the Reflect ability as well as the Immortality ability, Greater Bone Shield and Lesser Bone Shield are exactly the same. The only difference is that the word Greater could be used to describe the unnecessary strain that is being put on your coin pouch. Hardmark Carapac is a boss that I have done thousands of times across all of my accounts, so I can absolutely speak to how Necromancy performed here. You're gonna notice that I was able to melt the first phase just by spending all of my stacks and using all of my special attacks, but I didn't need to use Living Death. And this is very important because the most important mechanic of Carapac is Warp Time. While under Warp Time, you can use any ability you would like and that ability will not end up on its proper cooldown. Instead, it'll be available again every single time you use Warp Time, which is every 30 seconds. Because of this, instead of using Living Death and then once it expires, having to wait a full minute after it expires for it to come back off cooldown, you can instead use Living Death with 100% uptime, which is extremely powerful and extremely strong. I don't think I completely refine these skills and the potential for Necromancy at Carapac might be even further beyond what I'd even done here. But I got a number of kills in the three minutes and 10 seconds to three minute and 20 second range, which is a few seconds faster than my kill times on a Slayer task, hybriding with melee and magic. Your mileage will vary here, and I did find Necromancy at Hard Mode Carapac to be more challenging and complicated than using ranged and Bic arrows. But complexity aside, if you're looking to get those faster kill times, it performed exceptionally well, and I would highly recommend it. Normal mode went about how you'd expect. It was extremely smooth and easy, and even though Carapac is only two years old, it feels like this boss has just about been out power crept by Necromancy. Overall, I'm gonna throw Hard Mode Carapac in the A tier. It was nice not having to worry about getting a Slayer task, the kill times are competitive, and although I will probably go back with another combat style at some point, if you asked me to grind Hard Mode Carapac for a Fractured Staff of Armadol, I would put on my Necromancy gear and I wouldn't look back. Of every boss we've done so far, Araxor was by far the most difficult one to rate. And the reason for this is pretty simple. If you're going for a speed kill and you're trying to do what is called a solo skip, Necromancy performs exceptionally well. This is the technique where you spend the first part of your fight gaining stacks, setting up a crazy damage output rotation, and then you deal 100,000 damage to Araxor and phase it before it begins to heal, effectively skipping an entire phase. This is great for speed kills and fun personal records, but it only works when the minion path is open. And for these solo skips, which I have done with ranged, melee, and now Necromancy, Necromancy performed by far the best and the easiest. It was the first time that I was able to get one consistently every single kill without having to do anything super, super crazy or super sweaty from a rotation standpoint. It was as simple as building up all of my stacks and then unleashing them on Araxi as soon as I possibly could with the aid of a death mark. But I've got to say, that is one of the nicest looking combos you can ever do. No matter what combat style you're using, go for a solo skip at Rax. It is one of the coolest speed kills in the entire game. It's also really cool that you're able to get a solo skip without even using living death. So you can save your living death rotation for the final phase and make sure that that final phase goes by almost instantaneously. But now let's talk about the negatives, and there are several. The first thing I want to talk about is the Mirror Back Spider. If you get a Mirror Back Spider spawn, you would think that you'd be able to use one of Necromancy's many area of effect attacks to very effectively get rid of all the minions. But unfortunately, that isn't a very good option because if you use an area of effect attack on the Mirror Back Spider, as well as a Raxor or a Raxi, what you're actually gonna end up doing is area of affecting yourself and you're gonna end up one shot. There's a similar issue with the web shield, which is that if you inadvertently deathmark or you're wearing the tier 90 power gear that deathmarks automatically, what can end up happening is if you inadvertently attack yourself, well, instead of just attacking yourself, you're actually gonna end up deathmarking yourself. And that is a very fast, effective way to send yourself a one-way ticket to death's office. 
The two other things I didn't like about Necromancy at Rax are as follows. The first is that if you go in with Necromancy and burn the web down, you have no idea which variety of Araxor you're going to get spawned in. Because Necromancy falls outside of the combat triangle, so does Araxor spawn. Where if you were to use one of the original combat styles, Araxor would always spawn at whatever is weakest to you. Because of this, if you want to game the system and get a specific spawn type, which has a specific better drop rate for one of the three noxious weapons, you're going to have to bring a main hand weapon of a different combat style and equip it while you're burning down the web. That's not something that's the end of the world, but it is pretty annoying. The next criticism is a little less minor and a little more annoying, which is that on paths 2 and 3, as you transition between the second and the third phases, for whatever reason, all of your stacks get reset. And because of this, you've got these two time phases that are pretty much designed for building up your stacks. And it would be absolutely perfect to build them up and then let them loose on phase three to get yourself a very fast, effective kill time. But as soon as you transition over between phases two and three, all of your stacks are just magically gone and you have to restart with none. And because of this, not only is necromancy not super effective, I would actually reckon it is slower than any of the other combat styles if you're doing slower kills on the second or the third path. So this one's pretty simple. If you're going for a personal record down path one, Necromancy gets an S, but for every other application at Araxi and for general use at the boss fight if you wanted to camp or get a weapon, I'm going to put Necromancy in the C tier. It honestly didn't impress me at all. It feels so weird to be soloing Nex with a combat style that isn't range, because Nex notoriously will pray deflect melee at certain points of the fight and pray deflect magic at certain points of the fight as well pretty much forcing you to use the range combat style unless you want to have to off the boss at random points or end up hurting yourself. But Necromancy falls outside of the combat triangle, and I guess Nex forgot to read up on her Deflect Necromancy prayer book, and because of that, you can absolutely body this boss with Necro. One of the things that's annoying at Nex, especially with a lower tier setup, is a difficulty hitting the boss. Nex has absurdly high defense, even with a Nihil, and if you splash at the wrong time using range, it can be a little bit annoying and it can mess up your kill. But Necromancy doesn't have that issue because Necromancy quite simply can't splash. So long as you're using Necromancy, you have a 100% hit chance, and instead of having hits and splashes, your overall damage output will go down the lower your accuracy is. Although I've done over 2,000 Nex solos, this isn't the boss I'm the quickest at, but I was able to get a personal record with Necromancy without working too hard at it, and the biggest, most advantageous thing I would say about this boss fight is the fact that I could stay multiple kills per trip. I threw on the Persistent Rage Relic, and instead of having to bank and go back every single time, I just hung out in the room, and every single time Nex spawned, I was able to get a kill. I don't necessarily think that Nex with Necromancy is better than Nex with the range combat style, but when you look at the cost of the gear setups for effective kills, Necromancy definitely wins out on the accessibility front. It's just an easier, more accessible way to do the boss, and for me personally, I'm gonna bring Necromancy, and I'm not gonna look back. The next boss we're going to be going to is the Danger Chicken, and this is a boss that prior to Necromancy I had no real interest in doing. I had about 1,500 kill count back in 2017, but I hadn't been back since and I had no interest in going back since. So of course, you already know, we had to start things off by trying a solo. And after a few hours of attempts, I was able to get an extremely clean one. I've done Solo Angel of Death before, but my final kill time was over 10 minutes faster than my original solo kill with magic, and it felt significantly easier too. Being able to wear the tier 90 tank gear to give yourself a ton of extra life points to deal with the mechanics and solo tank the pools was absolutely awesome. And in general, being able to build and spend your sacks made the boss fight flow extremely well. When you needed damage, all you had to do was plan ahead and you'd have all of the damage you needed and more. But by far, the most satisfying part of Solo Angel of Death was the fact that if Angel of Death is standing directly in the middle of the room, you can use Threads of Fate on AOD, and then at that point you can do a Threads of Fate combo that will both hit and completely kill all four amalgamations at the exact same time. This is probably the single coolest thing I've done with Necromancy up to this point. As fun as it was in a solo, I know that's not entirely practical, and the majority of people are not looking to solo Angel of Death, they're looking to do seven. So I went and did about 800 of them. And my final verdict is that Necromancy makes Angel of Death significantly easier and more accessible than any other combat style. Unlike the other styles where you'd usually start the fight by doing a pre-build on a dummy and setting up a rotation, at Necromancy, you wait for the base to do their conjures, you copy them, and you have an extremely smooth, fast kill. Being able to use Threads of Fate to take out both the amalgamations and the minions is extremely effective, so as long as you delegate certain team members to do each one, you won't have to worry about the amalgs or the minions. AOD7s went from one of my most disliked bosses to one of my favorite pastimes, and I even started hosting AOD kills with learners in my Discord community because I could not get enough of this boss. And if that's not enough for an S for me, I don't know what is. 
Usually when I make a testing video, I make a joke about the Queen Black Dragon because I don't have the greatest history there. I lost two lives on my last hardcore, and overall, this boss has been the bane of my existence for a number of years. And it's a bit of a recurring joke that I go in, I beat up the boss very effectively with the weapon, and then I say, hey look, the weapon did well here. Because in reality, the Queen Black Dragon is far too easy of a boss to really be a part of this video. But this time around, the QBD actually bested me yet again, because there is a bug with Deathmark, where if it procs twice back to back, well, guess what? You will phase the boss twice back to back, but the platform will not unlock. So not for the first time in my life, I actually perished by the hands of the Queen Black Dragon and I had to teleport out. If you fight the Queen Black Dragon in power gear and you encounter this bug, there is no way to complete the fight without leaving or teleporting out, so that's Queen Black Dragon 1, me 0. But I will go back and get some revenge. Let's just not use Deathmark this time, and you'll see that I was able to calmly cruise my way to an effective 28 second PR. For Queen Black Dragon, it goes like this. If you're wearing the tier 90 power gear that randomly death marks all the time, well, it's gonna belong in the F tier. But for anything else, it gets a B. At the end of the day, this boss does not have enough life points for current your power creep, so you're gonna melt her with just about anything. Just make sure not to death mark. Solak is one of my favorite bosses in the entire game. I've got the title, and I also have over 2,300 kill count here. I've done a ton of solos, duos, and group kills as well, so I can absolutely speak to how Necromancy performs at this boss. Initially, I was a little skeptical of the performance, because the 90 second cooldown on Living Death I felt might cause some issues with sustained damage, especially on the second and third phases, but oh boy, was I completely and utterly wrong. Because Necromancy is a poisonable target, you can use the synergy of the Blood Reaver Familiar, Cinderbane Gloves, Weapon Poison, as well as the Zombie's Poison effect to deal an absolute ton of poison damage, and with all of that, we were able to get a very clean root skip, where I was able to deal 500,000 damage to the boss and clear out all the rootlings with extra time to spare. This is very different from when you're going in with magic and melee hybrid kills, where a lot of the time it's a pretty close call and you can end up getting into the arms and legs while still having a couple rootlings left to take out. The other thing that was really satisfying was watching my skulls bounce to the rootlings and then back to Solak as well. So not only were they helping me phase the boss, but they were also clearing out rootlings for me, and I could run along the rootlings with them bouncing between Solak and the root over and over again. Heading into the arms and legs, the attack range on Threads of Fate is not good enough to reach both arms, so you're kind of on your own for those. But for the legs, it's a really fun combo. And then I was able to one cycle the core with ease, just using Deathmark, some thresholds, and not a whole lot else. And then we head into phase two. There's a decision you have to make when you're doing Solak on phase two. If you're newer or going for a slower, safer kill, you would actually go up and clear the storm. But if you're comfortable with your healing ability, you can actually opt to do a storm tank, and you'll end up taking storm damage for pretty much the rest of the kill. Kill. This used to be seen as a very advanced method because the damage you take was very difficult to mitigate. But I've gotta say, the combination of the Blood Reaver and the Ghost is absolutely nuts, and no matter how much damage I was taking from Solak and from the Storm, I didn't really have to use any defensives, and I also pretty much didn't have to eat. I did what is usually considered a high danger, risky play to save myself about 30 seconds, and I didn't even notice that I was doing it in the first place. It really didn't feel like the Storm was active at all, and the Ghost plus Reaver combo was able to outheal absolutely everything. Phase 3 is the phase where you have to charge up all the pads and proceed into phase 4. We're gonna speed it up here because there's not a whole lot to say about it. Regardless of what combat style you bring, it pretty much goes the same way. Heading into Aerithor, it was extremely easy to one cycle with Necromancy, especially aided with a little bit of deathmark action, and then heading into the last phase, I used Living Death and absolutely bodied him. If I were to do this again, I honestly don't even think you'd need to use Living Death on the last phase, and I may have used it earlier than that, to get a faster Aerithor and a faster phase point as well. To put into perspective how ridiculous getting a 5 minute and 17 second Solak kill is, I grinded for 18 straight hours very recently to get myself a 5 minute and 45 second kill for the PVM Encyclopedia Mastery Tag, and with Necromancy, in only a couple tries, I absolutely bodied it. I really have nothing bad to say about Necromancy's performance as Solak, this is absolutely ridiculous. The amount of damage I was able to output, the kill time, the performance, the food usage, the storm tank, this was insane, and I could not recommend it enough. I will be using Necromancy at Solak from here on out, but if you are someone that is looking for easier, less technical kills, you're probably still better off using Bic Arrows, because instead of requiring some knowledge about rotations, Bic Arrows pretty much just require using Bic Arrows, so that's probably an easier solution, but I don't think anything is faster or cleaner than Necromancy. I have more kills at Telos than any other boss in RuneScape, and it's not even close. Across my three accounts, I've defeated Telos over 7,500 times, almost exclusively with magic. And because of that experience, I was really dreading going to Telos with Necromancy, because I didn't think I would be able to perform well enough with Necromancy for it to be able to compete with what I knew and what I'd done so many times in the past. 
And oh boy, was I completely and utterly incorrect. When you bring necromancy to Telos, even at 2,449% enrage, which is what I was doing here, as long as you have a decent DPS rotation, the boss will simply perish, phase after phase after phase. He doesn't really last long enough or survive long enough in the majority of these phases to even do a single special attack. And I was absolutely astounded and flabbergasted the entire time I was doing this testing, because this blew my mind. The Telos that I'm used to doing, you use Telos' mechanics and you play the boss fight around them. You have to be preemptive and prepare for them, and the rotation you use is very specific. And with Necromancy, I was quite literally just hitting stuff. And let me tell you, it was working. Out of the last font on phase four, Deathmark will activate on Telos so long as you hit, which of course you will always do because Necromancy can't splash. So that was an extremely nice and convenient thing. For anyone that struggles with phase four, that can make Necromancy a pretty good option. And then let's head in to phase five. Unlike with a different style, I didn't really have a set rotation for this phase five. I started off with Reflect, and then at that point, I was pretty much hitting stuff and trying to deal as much damage as I possibly could. I used Natural Instinct, I used Living Death, and then I barricaded as the first Rockfall came down. And then at that point, you're just gonna watch Telos' life points drop and drop and continue to drop. And that is a three minute and 15 second personal record, which is actually faster than any of my previous 2449% kills that I've been able to do with magic. I cannot stress enough how many hundreds of hours it took for me to truly hone my craft at Telos with magic and have a deep understanding of exactly what to do every phase to clear it without using any food and to clear it effectively as well. And to see that completely blown out of the water with Necromancy was absolutely shocking to me. And because of that, I'm gonna put Necromancy Telos at the top of S. You don't really need to understand Telos to be able to do Necromancy with Telos, you just need to be able to understand Necromancy. And if you can do that, you're gonna be able to get to 4,000% Telos, no problem at all. Virago is an interesting one, because in order to solo Virago, you need to understand a lot of the intricate mechanics, and it's not exactly a beginner-friendly activity. It's something that I'd previously done with magic and with range, so trying it out with Necromancy was a really fun challenge. Unfortunately for Virago though, Necromancy has a lot of things that make it extremely effective, especially for phases one through four. Virago will reset your stacks between every phase, which you might view as a negative, but it also allows you to drop target between every phase, which means you can start every single phase by losslessly doing all of your conjures and commanding your ghosts. And the result of this is an absolute ton of damage dealt and not a ton of damage taken. I mean, just look at this phase three. I was able to get through this third phase faster than I'd ever been able to with any of the other combat styles, and I had a lot of fun doing it as well. But by far the most difficult and important phase when you're looking at Virago is the fifth and final one. Usually you'd start phase five of Virago by putting on a melee main head weapon and using the Stadius Warhammer special attack to prevent you from splashing too much. But because Necromancy quite simply doesn't splash, I didn't even bother with the hammer and I got right to dealing damage. You could alternatively start this part with Barricade, but I elected not to just to see how much juice Necromancy really had. I used my Death Grasp special attack as well as my tier 95 special attack to get myself a little bit of damage, and I was actually able to positively push the boss despite taking a number of bombs. Heading into the first reflect, I'm going to do a technique called bomb stacking. And how this works at Virago is every single time he hits you with a blue bomb, you end up getting one square of pushback. But if he hits you with multiple blue bombs at the exact same time, you still only get one tile of pushback. If you go to max distance as Virago launches a bomb, and then you quickly move into Virago's main distance as he launches another one, both bombs will collide with you at the exact same time, effectively having the pushback you take. After my nice bomb stacking adventure, I decided it was time to quit messing around, use Living Death, and push the boss all the way to the mall spot. And I enjoy this quite a bit. I think my preferred combat style for this is still magic, but that's probably because I've been maging at Virago for over five years. And if you're someone new who's looking at learning how to do Virago, I think Necromancy is a very good option and a very strong play. It did everything I needed it to do, and because of that, it's going in the A tier. Now it's time for the most disappointed that I was in the making of this video. Because on paper, I thought that Necromancy would perform awesome for Solo Beastmaster. This is something that I've done, I believe, more than anyone else in the game, having over 50 Beastmaster solos, all with magic. And in my head, I felt like Necromancy would have all the tools. And at the beginning, it proved very true. I had a very clean, easy, awesome time dealing with the Aerit and Charger phase at the beginning. But then we encountered an issue that proved to be completely and utterly insurmountable. When you're doing a Beastmaster solo, you have to be running around for a large portion of the fight. This is especially important if you use the new method, which involves not letting Beastmaster hit you a single time all the way up to 750,000 life points with melee. So long as he doesn't punch you, he doesn't spawn one of the pets, and you can actually cruise to a relatively simple Beastmaster solo where you don't have to take a lot of damage or deal with too many mechanics. But unfortunately, with a six tile attack range, I just couldn't do it. 
In order to deal damage to Beastmaster, I had to consistently be far too close to him to prevent him from mailing me, and I found it extremely difficult to kite. So unfortunately for me, what I thought was going to be an absolute S tier and a game changer for Solo Beastmaster, I personally wasn't able to get it to work, and I spent over three hours here. That said, if you're doing a regular Beastmaster kill or a regular raid with 10 people, you'll have a fine time with Necromancy. I'm not going to say that it outperforms the other styles, but it absolutely works. And especially if you're looking for a setup that doesn't have a ton of requirements or is fairly inexpensive, if you got that Necromancy setup, you're going to have a good time. Because of that, I'm going to throw it in the top of B. Next up, the boss that apparently only 1% of the player base has killed, it's time to try out Zamorak with Necromancy. And the first thing we're going to look at here is me skipping every single mechanic at 500% in rage simply by building up my stacks, charging up the pad, and then yeeting all of them at the boss in no particular order. This is something that is possible with the other combat styles, but it was very fun and very clean with Necromancy. You've also got a little ghost healing you the whole time, and overall I had zero complaints about the performance of Necromancy throughout the first six phases. It was pretty fast, it was pretty easy, and it was also pretty nice to be able to redo all of my conjures for free after clearing my target by killing the witch after every pad. It just made life a little bit easier. Then we get into phase seven, and the best way for me to describe phase seven is it's complicated. Unlike the other styles where you'd want to quickly kill the demon and then kill your two runes as quickly as possible, I found the most effective way to do phase 7 Zamorak with Necromancy was to simply ignore the bomb entirely, lower the second rune, and then kill the first rune. And then at that point, all I'm doing here is I'm building up and setting up an absolute ton of stacks. The reason I'm doing this is because at 500% in rage, the boss only has 166,000 HP. And you might be thinking that that's a lot of life points, but you've got to remember that 10 Storm Shards and Shatter will do 30,000 damage, and Death Mark will also do 30,000 damage. So really, I have about 8 seconds to deal 100,000 damage. With Necromancy, that is absolutely free. It felt really weird to me to just completely ignore the bomb that was charging up and let it charge up to 100,000 damage, but especially paired with the Ring of Death, this worked, and this worked extremely well. And if I were doing Zamorak with Necromancy, this is probably the approach that I would take. But that's only 500% in rage, and at enrages of 1,000% and above, Zamorak maxes out his Phase 7 life points at 250,000, per person. So in a solo, I've got 250,000 damage to deal with. Does the same method work? And I am here to announce that it does. Even with me flubbing the rotation a good bit, I was still able to absolutely body this at above 1,000%, which means you could technically conceivably do this all the way to 4,000% in rage and never have to worry about the time race at all. The reason this is significant is it allows you to do a completely different pad order on phases 1 through 6, because usually if you're using the standard method where you have to tank a lot of damage, you have to save a lot of the really strong defensive edict buffs for later on, so that you make sure that you have a lot of life points and you also have good defensive function. But if you're planning on YOLOing the phase 7, you can actually get through those first 6 phases while keeping your defensives extremely functional and your life points extremely high. So if you're willing to give this method a shot, it can actually bring you a much easier kill all the way through. But then we get to one large negative, which is that Death Skulls work in a very weird way on Phase 7, where instead of just going on to Zamorak and bouncing between your character and Zamorak, they will also bounce around and hit the B or the X rune, and they can actually kill the runes during your cycle, and then in turn, get you killed. In the clip we're looking at right now, I managed to kill Zamorak as my Skulls bounced and killed the B, and because of that, after completing the kill, I died after the phase transitions, and even if you think you've survived a kill despite using Death Skulls, you may actually find yourself on the wrong side of Death's office after the kill ends. Zamrock is the final boss, and is also one of the most difficult to rate. After thinking about it a lot, I decided to put it in B, because if I were to go to Zamrock right now, for high enrage, I'd still prefer to use magic, and for lower enrages, I would still prefer to range camp. But if you've tried the other combat styles at Zamorak and it hasn't gone particularly well, you should absolutely give it a try with Necromancy because it just might be the difference in strategy and difference in method you need to successfully get some kills. Okay, we have now successfully tested out pretty much every single boss in RuneScape with Necromancy, and this is my final tier list and the end of my comprehensive review. Thank you all so much for watching, and with that said, considering it is 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to bed. Take it easy, everyone.